There is a light in my life shining over me. Amen? Amen. Amen. The problem is when there's a light in your life shining over you, you can see things. Amen? Amen. Sometimes things we don't want to see. We're amen and now, but we'll see how we go as we move along. Amen? All right. Three of you. Wait one second, and we're going to welcome our friends in here. Welcome to our Facebook friends, and for all of you who came here tonight, I'm grateful that you're here, and I'm really excited because I feel like the Lord wants to do something, and it's, it's an amazing journey, this journey of faith, and as we move along, listening to Brother Dave say he had a rough week, and uh, reflecting on a, a passage of scripture that gave him the ability to press through, is a, that's an amazing reality that we have that right within our midst, and the more that we hide the word in our heart, the more we're able to press forward and find that bit of encouragement in the midst of crazy times. Amen? So as we press forward tonight, I, I'm really hoping that the Lord helps us uh, work through a concept that we, we talked about it a few weeks ago, about you know sometimes our eyes, our physical eyes, are a hindrance for us. Right, because we rely on the things we can do in and of ourselves and we don't rely on the Lord uh, to guide our steps. And so that's one of the things, you know, we were learning about what it is to see with our ears, to, to pay attention to the directing and a guidance of the Lord based on Him in a quiet time where there's confusion and those kinds of things in our life. And we find the comfort that is only found in the guiding hand of the Lord. Amen? So tonight I want you to really be able to leave this place pliable and usable by God. How many would say amen to that? Amen. All right, amen. Well, here's the problem that I've found in my own life. So a lot of times when I come to the pulpit, I like to just bear my soul because I believe you can relate with that. I believe when you hear yourself in what's being said, uh, then you can realize that it started with conviction of my heart and then, and then you have an opportunity to just be exposed before God and say amen to things because he already knows anyway. Amen? Okay. Most people, they don't listen. They don't listen to what's being, said, what's being said with an intent to understand, I've heard said once, and I thought it was amazing. They listen with an intent to reply. They don't listen with an intent to understand, but they listen with an intent to reply. By an amen, how many would say you're guilty of that? All right. It's a crazy world we live in, isn't it? We feel like we have to defend ourselves. We feel like our motives, if we're you know, relatively uh, convinced that we're on a journey with the Lord Jesus, we feel like we need to somehow uh, defend ourselves what somebody else might think of us. And so as they're beginning to tell us something, instead of our ears being able to digest that, if you will, uh, we're already preloading an answer, even as we hear things begin to be said, right? Amen? I do it. Listen, I'm telling you straight up. So it's a very hard thing to overcome. You know, so I came in here for, our, how many enjoyed the music tonight? Amen? Uh, well, I do a devotion. I come in and do a devotion every time that we get together. Uh, they have practice, and I'll come in and do a devotion. So over is here. They, they're right in the middle of it. I brought one this week, and I thought, when I first heard it myself, it didn't sit well with me until I got through it. So it, it, it had to be digested before you understood what was being said. So I came in with a, a scripture. James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So boy, when you're going to hear your devotion and you hear that on the front end, you're thinking, what in the world comes next, right? Quick to listen. And I would just say tonight that maybe we would want to Try to ask the Lord for that ourselves, that we'd be quick to listen. But that we would listen with ears that had the intent of understanding. 
instead of replying to or a disclaimer for our own selves. Maybe we would just try to see ourselves in the scriptures tonight. And I have to say, I just feel like I'm, I really feel like the Lord wants to communicate something very clearly tonight. I've got one more scripture out of James. And if it's applicable to you, make application. James chapter 1, once again, verse 5 through 8 says, If anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. I'd have to ask a question. Are you double-minded and unstable in all you do? It's a tough thing to overcome. Double-mindedness. You know, living in the world, and, and it's not just living in the world or, or coming to a place in your life that you say, I want to... I really want to make a difference. I want to listen to the Lord. I want to be part of what God's doing. It's really getting your mind wrapped around how damaging it is to put out there in front of the world your life up for the opinion of many. Because as they respond and you take in information, it has an undercurrent of negative impact in your life. And that's one of the things to understand about asking God for wisdom and not doubting. In other words, you're asking God for wisdom, you're digging into the Word, and as He illuminates, there's a light in my life shining over me, right? When that Word starts illuminating and we see something we don't like that becomes illuminated, then we go and we seek other information from our worldly sources, as though it needs to be under review. And as a result of that, we become double-minded. In other words, you can't make a decision either way because you're stuck on, well, the Bible says this is what God says. I've seen it. I've looked at it straight in the face. However, I've got a whole crew over here that wants to tell me that I don't need to pay a lick of attention to that. And so I'm on the fence. And to make no decision to follow the Lord is to have already have made a decision. And it's to not listen to Him. There is no on the fence. Either you do what He says or you don't. Amen? Amen. Do you know who you are? Are you, done, are you this person that's double-minded and unstable in all their ways? Double-minded and unstable in all their ways. That's horrifying to me horrifying to me. It's like either you got to put your foot down on one side or the other of the fence, don't you? In other words, you're, you're going to have to come to a point and make a decision. Wh who are you? Do you think you know who you are? I got some quotes from some people that were asked a question. Who are you? I am who I am and I say what I think. I'm not putting a face on for the record. That's one. I realize that I am who I am, and that is it. Like it or lump it. I'm not around to please anyone. There's another one. God made me the way I am, and I accept myself. I am who I am, and I'm proud of myself. There's another one. I am what I am, and I can't change that. I am who I am, and I am what I am. I do what I want to do, and I ain't never gonna do anything different. And I don't care who likes it and who doesn't. Buck Owen said that one. How about this one? I am who I am because of the people who have influenced me growing up. And many of them were gay. No one has the right to tell anyone what makes a family. Drew Barrymore said that one. 
No one has the right, huh? Do you think God does? Do you think God does? I just got to tell you, because in my life I've walked in a lot of different folly over the years. That isn't one of them. But I've been on a lot of stupid roads. And I've been down all sorts of different places that I shouldn't have been. And I absolutely had no concern whatsoever of what God had to think about it. Praise God for Jesus. He's the one who rescued me. But God does have the right. He does have the right. He defines the family, most certainly. Colossians 1.16 says this, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Amen? Pretty clear that he has a purpose in, and he has created all things, followed up by Genesis chapter 2. Verse 20 through 25 said, So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the sky, and the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs. And he closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. He had taken out of the man, and he brought, it, he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. Boy, we've come a long way from there, haven't we? Sometimes we have strong feelings about things in life. And, and I'll, I'll have to say in Drew Barrymore's uh, defense, she was influenced largely and brought up in a household, and this is what she knew. Sometimes we have strong, strong feelings about things. Strong feelings, and guess what? They're wrong. Wrong. And so when you think in terms of, of the God of all creation and his plan for our lives, it's critical that we understand he is God and we are not. Amen? And following him is something that requires us to understand that a lot of times in religious circles, people are brought up in a religious system and, they, and it runs very deep. And, and they don't understand that if it's not Scripture, if God didn't inspire it, then it's just something else. But nevertheless, the, the, the emotion runs deep, the commitment runs deep, and all of those things. And it causes people to have this division, this large division. And they'll die for these issues. But a lot of times when you're talking about things that, are, uh, that go directly against what the Scripture teaches, the next thing that happens, the next approach that people like to take is there is no God. We'll go with that one. They'll say there is no God, and as a result, then if there is no God, then certainly I'm not subject to anything that he has to say. But Psalm 14.1 says, The fool says in his heart there is no God. They are corrupt and their deeds are vile, and there is no one who does good. That's probably not the, the perspective that anybody sitting here tonight has, right? In other words, I mean, do we believe that there's a God? Is that's why you're here, amen? You can make some noise. Do you believe there's a God? Do you believe he has a son, his name's Jesus, and he died on a cross for your sins? Amen. There's an interesting thing, you know, in our own thinking. We come up with all these different things. I remember saying, I am who I am, and if you don't like it, you know, I was kind of like that one, you can lump it. That would have been probably what I would have said back in the day. I don't care what you think. All those things, right, Andy? Is that what we'd say? That's what it was. 
not good. But every now and then you'll get somebody that'll say something that's, you know, all right. How about this? I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I'm not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. That was John Newton that wrote that. Good stuff, huh? Here's one of his quotes. He says, This is faith, a renouncing of everything we are apt to call our own in relying wholly upon the blood, righteousness, and intercession of Jesus. You don't know who John Newton is? He's the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. Amen? Let's so read a little bit about him. But the line, the hour I first believed. The hour I first, he was in the bottom of a vessel that was taken on water. And they were furiously trying to, to get this water out so they would not sink. And he thought, surely, that that night it was over. Of course, we know that it wasn't. Can you imagine... He had an encounter that turned his life around. Interesting story. If you ever just pull up John Newton and, and take a look at his life, it's a long story, but it's excellent to see what God did. The question is, in our lives, are we moldable to what the Lord wants to do in our life? Are we rigid? You know, are, do, we, do we have this mindset that, you know, I'm who I am, and if God doesn't like it, he can lump it. Anybody amen to that one? Oh boy, hang on. Man, I was in that, I was in that school of thought at one time. And the Lord rescued me. But the reality of it is that God, God wants to do something with us, and he wants our heart to be in it. But we really got to comp we got to comprehend who he is in relation to who we are, and sometimes we don't get it. We just don't get it, and so there's a problem. We're not moldable. We just kind of just go along to get along. We rely on his amazing grace, don't we? His amazing. We rely on his grace. We rely on his grace and mercy to to forgive us because we fumble the ball so much. But it's not it's not as a result of us in pursuit of him. And we're listening for him. We're listening to him. We, we just didn't. We missed him. We missed him. And, and we did something inadvertently. It's not because of that. It's because we're just on a different stinking frequency. And we're doing our own thing. And because of it, there's a constant need to come back to the place to say, Oh, God, forgive me. Here I am again. God, forgive me. Here I am again. God, forgive me. And I'm going to receive your mercy. Withhold what I deserve. And I, I want your grace. Undeserved favor. I'm, I want to pray. I'm going to ask you, God, God. You know, I want this, I want this. It's like a Christmas wish list, for heaven's sakes. Instead of us having an ability to see what God is doing and has done already in our lives, and he wants to use us in a way that requires us, listen to this, to be molded to a usable position. Molded to a usable position. If you have your Bibles with you, we're looking at Jeremiah 18, verse 1 and following. Jeremiah 18, verse 1 and following. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the wheel, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, slapping it as seemed best, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me and he said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hands of the potter, so are you in my hands, Israel. If at any time I announce 
that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed. And if that nation, I warn, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that the nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I intended to do for it. Now therefore I say to the people of Judea and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Look, I'm preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways in your actions. But they will reply, it's no use. We will continue with our plans. We will all follow the stubbornness of our evil hearts. Does that just hit you? Let's just stop right there. Doesn't that sound like the dumbest thing you've ever heard? We will continue with our plans and we will follow in the stubbornness of our evil hearts. Are you hearing me? Hello. Can you, can you imagine God saying, here, listen, here's the deal. Here's a potter, and you see this image, and he's spinning this pot. And all of a sudden, it, it, it doesn't look like it, it's marred. It has a problem. Impales it into itself and starts another one right up. And he says, you see... Can I not do the same thing with you, Israel? I mean, that's a graphic picture. You hear what I'm telling you? Here, here's the problem. We don't get the picture. I, I'm, I'm reading that to you right here, right here in this room. And it's just, it's quiet. You get the picture. The one who said, let there be light, and there was a solar system. The one that put a vault in the sky that separated waters and land. That God said, hey, listen, Israel, see that potter and that wheel spinning around? See that guy just slam his hand in that thing? And it's, it's a memory right there. I'm, I've got a plan, and that's going to be you. Now, to me, I think I might want to consider a different response than I'm going to continue with my plans and follow my stubborn, evil heart. Would you say that's probably not the wisest response? I think we do the same thing, don't we? We don't understand that God wants to do something with our life that's very productive. And he wants to form us. You know, I know a little bit about this pottery thing. I understand that if there's air pockets and all sorts of different things, we talked about this with our men's group this week to some degree about when things are being formed, there's various reasons that you just say that one's not going to work. We're going to do something else. And so sometimes in our life, we're, we're on what we perceive as God's potter's wheel, but we don't realize we're not on his wheel at all. We're on our own. And the things that are happening and being molded in our life have nothing to do with his direction or guidance. They have everything to do with ours. He says, listen, I want to take you off that wheel and put you on the right wheel, but it's going to start with, it's going to start with a lump of clay. Well, wait a minute, I'm already made into a vase. I'm not interested in a vase. You're going to be a lump of clay. You're going to be used in a different way. Are you with me? You know what I think of this picture of pliable and moldable. If you'd imagine a pot, the potter and the potter's wheel, anybody by an amen if you've ever used a potter's wheel? Three? Three of you? Four of you? All right. Potter, they're interesting. They, they move along, and, and if you're really good at it, you can get something really working, but if you've got something going on that you are uncoordinated and that wheel spins inaccurately, or if you're kicking the on the bottom of it, it's not spinning like it's supposed to, or it's a powered one, and for some reason you jerk or twitch or something, it's over. 
you know, what's spinning around is going to have an, a huge impact. And the same thing as losing a wheel weight on a car tire, it's over. It'll throw it right off the wheel, so on and so forth. A lot of things happen, but the reality of it is that God wants to make us pliable and usable according to his plan, which means you start with a lump of clay, right? You interested in that? Or do you got something built up already that you don't want to negotiate, maybe? I just want to just take a look at something. The example for us, the lump of clay that God started with, that made all the difference in all of our lives, found in Isaiah 53, verse 2 and following. So he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we would desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one whom people hide their faces. He was despised. In, we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that was brought upon that was brought upon brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we were healed. That's Jesus crushed. He was on the potter's wheel and he was crushed. In order that what we would see as the finished beautiful work of art was a risen Savior. And God wants to do something magnificent in our lives. He wants to do something that requires us to get over ourselves. To get out of the way. Cut the nonsense. Do you understand the magnitude of Isaiah 53? Do you understand what's being painted there? Is Jesus came from his place in heaven to be in this lowly place from out of the gate only to be crushed under the hand of God in order that we would be redeemed. You want to get under that potter's wheel, folks? Hello. Are you guys still here? You still here? Listen to Isaiah 29, 16. It says, You turn things upside down as if the potter were like to be like the clay. Shall what was formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? Does it sound ridiculous? Reversed roles? Guys, listen to what I'm telling you. That God wants to do something in your lives. Every one of us. He's the potter, we're the clay. And the problem is, the problem is, the problem is we're on the wrong stinking wheel. We're on the wrong wheel. We're on our own wheel. We got our own thing going. We're spinning it. We're refining it. We're doing all these things. And God says, no, stop. Come to the place to hear. I can't use you that way. I'm not interested in you that way. I want to spin you into something that has eternal consequence in the lives of many. His own son crushed for our iniquities. Molded into the Savior that died on the cross. Came out of the tomb victorious three days later. And because of that we can say Abba Father because he's our Father in heaven because of what Jesus did. But who would say, who would say, because of our life, that they've met that Savior? That we've been on the wheel and he's used us in that degree that, that we've become usable. Because you know what? At best, at best we don't understand. At best we get on that wheel and God starts moving us and, and refining us. 
He starts shaping us into things that as he's taking away stuff and he's adding to the dimensions of our character, we have a hard time. We struggle. That's reality. It's the world we live in. It's the life that we live here in America. And we don't realize there's a God of all creation that wants to do amazing things. And we have to learn some things about ourselves. We have to learn some things about ourselves. We have to understand that we, a lot of times, without saying the very words that says, I will continue in my own plans and I'll follow in my stubborn of my evil heart. We may not say that, but our actions communicate louder than our words. So my heart's been convicted, and I bring it before you. So what I do, I I like to come into devotions. I like to throw stuff out in front of the guys and then and watch their response and then get feedback and throw stuff out at them and get their response. Because I, I know that God's doing something. As, as we're working towards something, I know that we're going to get there if we can grasp the reality of who God is in the relationship as to who He is in relation to who we are. And if we let Him have that place in our life, if we not only let Him, we We covet the reality that he's going to do something amazing with our character. And that's not defined by my own understanding. It's defined by him. What he wants to accomplish. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 and following. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers... So they cannot see the light of the gospel that is displayed, that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servant, for Jesus' sake. For God, it's God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God. God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed from every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus, so the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that this life may also be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, and I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, We also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. For all this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day For our light and monetary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This this passage right here for me, to get my mind wrapped around this bigger picture, we carry this around in jars of clay, this all-surpassing power from God and not from us. Here's this problem. If at best we allow the Lord Jesus to put us on the wheel and we're on his wheel and then we think we have to add ourselves to what's going on. He says, no, not at all. Not at all. You don't have to add nothing. You're on the wheel and I'm spinning you. 
And you say, well, you know what, I'm very plain and I don't want to be all plain. And, you know, we're used to today in our conveniences of life, you know, we've got everything in the, uh, from paper plates to paper cups, you know. And we don't want to look like the plain Jane. You know, when you got company, you got to get out the good china, right? And in, the, in biblical times, there were things made out of wood, bowls and such like, and even baskets, even tightly woven ones, and there was, and there was clay, pottery, very durable. And then there was metal, really nice for the upper crustity people, right? But we're a jar of clay. A jar of clay. So that we could display Jesus through a life that nobody's looking at us, but looking at him. We're not interested in that, are we? We're not interested in it. All the things that God wants to do through our life, we keep getting in the way. We keep trying to display this jar. We keep trying to put it out in front. We're trying to decorate it up. We're trying to do all sorts of things. He says, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. I want to have you at this place that you know, you're out of the way and you're, you're not seen and, no, you know, and, and there's nobody looking at you. They're looking at the things that are in your life, but they're not looking at you. And in, during the time you're here on earth, they may never understand anything about the calling that you have on your life. But if you listen to the Lord Jesus, he's going to show you exactly what that calling is. And I heard it said it was really something special. Special, I thought, I heard it said that people don't understand your call because it wasn't a conference call. Amen? There's a call on your life. God wants to do something amazing, but we don't get it. We don't get it. We don't get that maybe I don't need to be all prettied up and I don't display, I don't need to display all the things that I want to display. That I just need to display Jesus through my life, means I'm going to wear things well. We don't want to think of ourselves in a lowly position, but we go back to Isaiah 53. He said, He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain, and he bore our suffering, and yet we considered him punished by God and stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we were healed. That's the clay Jesus was in. You hear what I'm telling you? There was nothing to attract us to him. He was on the potter's wheel, and he spun him to be exactly what he was called to be. And we have a hard time in our own lives to understand exactly what that looks like in our lives. That God might want to do something that radically, drastically changes the course of your life. Drastically and radically changes the course of your life. Isaiah 64, 8 says, Yet the Lord, our, our Father, we are the clay, and you are the potter. We are the work of your hand. Do you guys get it? Are, are you at a place in life? Because I think we've got to get to a place in life to get this. You know, I have, I have this pottery understanding because I was the guy who couldn't listen to anything in junior high school, right? And in, in high school. But junior high school, I was really a clown. And I thought things were funny. A lot of times that weren't funny for everybody else. 
And I was artistic, so it got me a seat in art class. I could draw things. And so they took me halfway serious because I was artistic. So I would be unattended, and I could do things sometimes, and it would look really nice, and I didn't pay a lick of attention to what the teacher was saying. And so as a result, using a potter's wheel, teacher saying, listen, need that clay out. You've got to need that clay out. Need that clay out because if you don't need the clay out, when we kiln this stuff, it's going to explode. It's going to explode. Malarkey is what I'm thinking. Because I had something on the wheel that looked like a million bucks in my head, and there ain't nobody has anything that looks as cool as mine. So it's coming off that wheel, and it's going in the kiln to the destruction of many other youth's projects. It exploded. So think about that. It, it hits a nerve with me, this whole potter's wheel and this whole concept. About our, we build our lives on what? By what measurement is it a success? It is is the wheel that you're on, is God using your life in a way that's appealing to him? And, it, and quite frankly, sometimes he might take you down a road part way to teach you something, to implode you, to build you back up. We don't want to hear that at all. He might take us down a road to implode us, in, need us back, and then build us back up. Because we learn things about ourselves, Right? We learn things about ourselves. We learn things about God. We learn who he is. We start to see his character in our life. We're like, oh my word, Lord, you want to use me in this particular way. And that's why you're doing these things. So everything that I've been involved with up to this point, you brought me to a place of understanding. And now you're going to implode me to the place to build me up into who I'm supposed to be. And we flip out at all those things. We don't want to hear those things. We struggle with those things. But in reality, God wants to do something in our lives. And the question is, whose wheel are you on tonight? Whose wheel are you on? Are you on your own? Are you completely saying, you know what, I checked out a long time ago, preacher. I'm not interested in being on the Lord's wheel and where he can decide to implode or do whatever. And I don't want to understand. I don't get it. I don't want to understand it. I don't like it. I don't like the fact that he's the potter and I'm the stinking clay. But here's reality, folks. He is and we are. And you can resist that as long as you want to resist it. But he will have his way. So the question is, do you want to have the potter's masterful plan in your life accomplish the purpose in which he set forth for it to accomplish? Do you understand? Jesus got it. Came from a place in heaven to be crushed for our iniquities in order that we could be redeemed. But in our lives, you understand, we get to be the ones who introduce others to, to Christ through our lives, and, we, and it's contingent on us being this plain vessel, a plain vessel that, that would attract no one to yourself by the things of your capabilities or any of those things, but the submission to the Father who's elected to use you in whatever way he wants to, and you would just say, yes, Lord, it may mean it's going to deny you success in some areas. It's going to deny you favor in some people's eyes. Maybe it might. But somebody's redemption's got your name tied to it. And the question is, is he going to use your life to get it done, and are you going to be the jar of clay as fragile as that is? to display the life of Jesus through a life well lived. Every time when we conclude, we give an invitation, which simply means you have the opportunity to respond to God and what he's convicted your heart with. It means if he's tugging at your heart strings, don't dig your fingers into the seats and say, no, that, that ain't me. Maybe next week. There might not be a next week for you. Maybe there's never been a time in your life that you said, listen, God, I want, to, I want to receive the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I want to confess my sin before God. I'm a sinner. And I want to receive what Jesus did on the cross to count for the re my redemption of my sins, the payment for my sins. 
If you've never done that, you need to come forward and we'll pray right now and we'll do that. But if you have done that and you find yourself today and you're saying, listen, I'm spinning on some other wheel. I got my own thing going and I don't want anybody imploding nothing. But understand, the Bible says this, he that began that good work in you, he's faithful to bring it to completion and you might have an imploding involved in your life at the master's hands. I think you better get in alignment with them. On this side, take the confusion out of it. Say, God, I want to be who you've called me to be. Show me. And I don't want to be a double-minded person that's unstable in all my ways. I want to go down this road of life. Maybe I don't know all the answers, but I'm going to walk close to you who does. Let it be so. As the music plays, would you come? Father God, would you have your way in this time of invitation as our counselors come forward? God, would you do what only you can do in a human heart? Bring us to a place of conviction. God, that we would say yes to you. In Jesus' name, would you come as the music plays? shouting crucify could have come from these lips of mine the dirty shame was killing me it would take a miracle to wash me clean then became a free man that day. Fell like lightning, hit my ribs. A dead heart began to beat. The breath of God filled my lungs and the Holy Ghost away. became a free man that day. For God so loved the whole wide world, sent his only son to die for me. Arms spread wide for the whole wide world. His arms spread wide.
Father God, we thank you for this time. God, I pray that you are glorified in the content of our heart. God, as you looked to the recesses of areas, God, that we don't like to display at times, I pray that you would, as we go from this place, help us to live out what you've challenged us with. God, as we go from this place, keep us safe. Help us to realize you are the potter. Give us a willing heart that you would do with as you desire. Let it be so, we ask it, in the matchless name of our King Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed.